Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. Galen Druk is still on vacation, so you are stuck with me, Chadwick Matlin. Uh, I'm a deputy editor at 538, and we are back to discuss the last 48 hours of impeachment developments because there have been so many with me in the studio to discuss it's senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hi, Claire. Hi, Chad. What a treat to have my editor here. <laughs> and Claire's old editor, Micah Cohen, <laughs> our managing editor, to her right. Hi, Micah. Hello. I'm literally in the middle of, of oh. my two, as I was saying to Chad before, my once and current editor. We'll edit what you say on this podcast in real time. <laughs> but I'm very sure differently. You, that'll <laughs> be pleasant. Yeah, but we'll have differing <laughs> opinions. Uh, so on today's show, we're going to discuss uh, what was important in the whistleblower's complaint against President Trump uh, in Trump's dealings with the Ukrainian president. And we're going to talk about uh, what the congressional hearing with acting director of national intelligence, Joseph McGuire, told us about how this impeachment hearing might go. Uh, those are just two of the events of the last 48 hours. But let's also recap the rest of it. Uh, so deep breath. Mm. We last recorded, you guys last recorded a podcast on Tuesday evening after Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, said that she was opening officially an inquiry of impeachment into President Trump. Then on Wednesday morning, the White House declassified a summary of Trump's call with the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky. How do you say it? Claire, Claire yeah. does it way better. Vladimir Zelensky. Oh, last time you did it with more of a Russian... Inflection. I got an email from someone telling me it was offensive. Oh. I, I truly didn't mean it to be. Well, I'm glad you corrected it. for, for That That shows a real development. In I was thing. egging you on. So uh, No, I actually, it, when I originally read it, it was just meant that's how, there's a lot of O's in there, and that's how it it felt best to come out. <laughs> Getting all the consonants in. There's a lot of the O's in there. <laughs> the call, uh, the, sum <laughs> the summary of the call, confirmed reporting that Trump pressured Zelensky to look into the Bidens while also mentioning USAID to Ukraine. And that's what got us all into this this week, let's not forget, was the report that this call had happened and there was that pressure. Then on Thursday morning, which is today, we're recording this Thursday afternoon, the House Intelligence Committee released the whistleblower's complaint that started all this um, and the subsequent report from the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, which looked into the whistleblower's complaint. Uh, and th there were allegations in that complaint. And all of them are secondhand. The whistleblower, hi him or herself, I believe we still just do not know the, the gender, uh, is sort of collecting information from within the administration, essentially. And we'll get to potentially who that whistleblower, whistleblower might be later in the show. And based on talking to people within the administration, uh, the complaint alleges that Rudy Giuliani, as well as diplomats, followed up on that call that we now have the summary of uh, with Ukrainian officials. Ukrainian leadership believed that a call with Trump was contingent on being willing to, quote, play ball on Giuliani's requests for investigations, that there being sort of the subtext that they had to at least look into Biden if they wanted a continuation of aid. And then the complaint also alleges that, quote, senior White House officials had intervened to lock down all records of the phone call, especially the official word-for-word -word transcript of the call that was produced. And that the lawyers, White House lawyers directed staff to remove the transcripts from the computer system that is normally used to store the calls, and that uh, this might be an abuse of the system and, and it wasn't the only call where it happened. Couple Good. You're doing well. Thank you. A couple more details. <laughs> After those documents were released, McGuire testified, which we will discuss. And then just as we went into the studio, the New York Times uh, released a report that the whistleblower, according to their reporting, is a CIA officer with expertise in Ukrainian politics uh, who had been assigned to the White House for, for some reason. Yep. Good job, Chad. <sighs> Anything else, guys? No, that's a good summary. I mean, yeah. the, the complaint is secondhand, but basically says... The president inappropriately used his position to to further his own political ends um, by pressuring Ukraine to interfere in the election by withholding military aid. And more than that, and we should get into that, but what the complaint really adds that we didn't know before was essentially an allegation of a cover up. Right. That's the big new thing in the in the complaint, I think. Yeah. By the way, we should say that the the things lined out in the whistleblower complaint 
have been at least preliminarily confirmed by other people with knowledge of it and like the general fact pattern of the events has been confirmed uh, so so the person who wrote up the report seems to perhaps be someone who i mean cia analysts their actual job is to write reports like this typically <laughs> about other places but to essentially um synthesize and summarize and provide intelligence and the in the complaint what's said about the call matches the tr- the the summary of the call that was released right further corroborating perhaps the at least the the professionalism of the the complaint itself yeah no totally and actually like so when the call summary first came out i think all of us in the newsroom sort of increased our our level of like how big this story could be because we looked at it as if this is the best case scenario for the white house this is what they're releasing at the least this is trump pressuring a a foreign leader to intervene in a U.S. election, right? Right. Um, I think what the whistleblower complaint adds is like an even higher level of how bad this could potentially be because one, it adds these allegations of a cover-up and two, it adds one, like, okay, first of all, a lot of, two, one, sorry, Uh, two, two A, um, (laughs) it adds, in that complaint, there's all these other people who knew about this stuff and had concerns about it. So that adds a lot of potential witnesses or people who can speak to this, but also a lot more stuff on the, and we can get into this, on the, if if the White House was using military aid to pressure Ukraine, a lot more um, parts of that operation have come to light since the call summary came out. Does that make sense? In other words, it wasn't just Trump in passing on this phone call saying it. It appears like, or at least allegedly appears like, there were other efforts in that. There was follow-up on the call. There was follow-up, From not just Rudy Giuliani, but from people within the administration. So there was, it was, yeah, it wasn't just idle idle talk that went nowhere. And I we should say that, you know, someone like Barr, Bill Barr, the attorney general, has come out and said, oh, I didn't I was mentioned in this call, but I didn't do anything. But the memo does allege that other people in the administration followed up. So that's a that's a big deal. And I think that it's they followed up in on multiple occasions in a couple different countries. So it, it is, at least according to this memo, the allegations in the memo. So that's interesting and, and um yeah, a lot of fodder. Did Republicans find it as inter- as interesting as we did? Nope. <laughs> and so, what was the general approach for Republicans in response to the to the tran- to the transcripts? Well, I guess I, either or, because it, it, they haven't really they haven't differed that much between the, the sorry the the summary and the uh, whistleblower's complaint. So on the on the call summary, I think the the general response was uh, there's no evidence here of a quid pro quo. Right, that was the line they wanted to draw. Um, and literally was the talking point, which the Trump administration yeah. emailed out to Democratic House uh, members. And then recalled, special. reportedly. Yeah. Some low-level press staffer just had the worst day of their life. Poor person. Recalling an email. Uh, that's Anyway, um, so that was the line on the call summary. I think the line on the on the actual complaint, now that we have it, now that they have it, is still developing, I'd say. Um Look, for the most part, Republicans are still sticking by Trump. We've seen a few exceptions to that. But, you know, the, their line is mostly Democrats just want to impeach Trump and they're trying to find a way to do it. Right. I think for the for the call summary that was released yesterday, it was certainly what, what we've been saying. Oh, Republic, the Republican line was he didn't explicitly say, um, you know, the quid the quid pro quo situation, right? The, the words were never spoken. Then today during the hearing, and, and we can talk about that, that more in a second, but I think that Republicans on the committee when they were, um, when they had the microphone, spent a lot of time talking about it's illegal to, to leak national security information. That's the real story. The media is aiding and abetting yeah. this. And, and so, so it, it was definitely sort of trying to be directed towards other elements of this. The other big talking point among Republicans, I think, has been what you mentioned earlier, Chad, which is, as the complaint says itself, the whistleblower did not have and does not have 
did not directly witness this stuff um, and is more acting as a, a conduit of a conduit. Um, good word. So, you know, that is, I think, potentially for right now for Republicans, an area of weakness in the impeachment pursuit. But Democrats. Yeah, I think right now that's potentially for Democrats an area of weakness in their impeachment inquiry. But like I said earlier, it could also be an area of strength if these other people come out of the woodwork. You know, let me add one more approach or strategy that Republicans have taken, which is to feign ignorance about what's in the call and what's in what's in the complaint. Uh, Jennifer Habercorn, who um, who is a congressional reporter for the Los Angeles Times, tweeted earlier today that seven out of seven GOP senators she spoke to said they have not read the whistleblower complaint at one o'clock in the afternoon. And so and with the c- Congress going on recess, there is a sort of strategy for Republicans of let's wait and see how the next couple of weeks play out. So I don't have to go on record. That might bite me either way in the end. That's my favorite politician line. It's like I, did, I haven't actually I read haven't it, but let me yet. let me yeah. guarantee that someone on their staff has like <laughs> summarized it for them or read it to them. OK, we're back and here to talk about the hearing of acting Director of National Intelligence, Joe McGuire, Joseph McGuire. Um, Joe. We, you friends Joe, with him, Chad? Joe. <laughs> the most famous man in America. <laughs> Self-proclaimed. Self-proclaimed. That was my favorite that part of the hearing, That was definitely my favorite part. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, McGuire went uh, in front of co- the House Intelligence Committee on, on Thursday, and um, it was sort of the first moment where we could really see the lines of inquiry from each party play out after the release of these, of these documents. Um, and interestingly the hearing became more about the process of what McGuire did when it's quite legalistic. Yeah. When given the, uh, the complaint and the inspector general's assessment of the complaint. And so what was McGuire's, uh, rationale for what came next and what, what came next? (laughs) It was, it it, 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 go ahead. (laughs) So I just first want to make a note about McGuire and, how interesting it is to have a person on the, the you know basically the witness stand who is deeply uncomfortable with it and who obviously has very little experience with it as McGuire did. He wasn't next in line after no, uh, not at Coates all. left the DNI. He, he was he, he, it, someone else had to quit. And he, he's been on the job for like six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. yeah. So McGuire was I would say not a I mean he was not like a he made kind of grimaces during people's opening statements and and I think. In some ways, watching him, I kind of felt for the guy because he he sort of seemed to be in a in an awkward position. But here's the deal. McGuire kept on saying throughout the hearing that this was an unprecedented whistleblower complaint. Democrats continued to ask him throughout the course of, what, the three and a half hours, why did you not immediately turn over this whistleblower to complaint, complaint to Congress as every other whistleblower complaint from the intelligence community has been before? And as the statutes suggest Su- need to be. Suggest. And he said, well, this was an unprecedented situation because it involved uh, executive privilege. It could involve it executive could involve privilege. Executive privilege. Um, and basically he had he said that he had to go to the White House's Office of Legal Counsel to figure out whether or not he was a allowed to turn it over, or whether it would be sort of breaching executive privilege, and then there was this other separate, or or connected yet separate discussion of whether or not it met the standards for um, urgent. Like, urgent. It, whether it, as he kept on saying that the urgency of the complaint was actually a statutory, uh, a statutory. Um, definition that had to do, you know, whatever. So he said, I wasn't sure if this actually fell into the legal definition of urgent, which Democrats had a lot to say about. Right. So not all whistleblower complaints automatically go to Congress. Only ones that are deemed, what's the official language? It's like urgent something. But again, both sides, McGuire and the Democrats, everyone was pointing out this is the first time it hasn't been turned over. Something that did meet that threshold. Exactly. Right. right. Um, And and I just, I mean, one more thing on McGuire. I think as a as an overarching takeaway from the testimony, you saw this guy who McGuire is, you know, a person who talks to the president frequently. He said during his testimony, listen, I need to maintain a relationship with the president in order for him to trust me. And you saw him walking that line both in his testimony today and also in the description of his actions, the way he was sort of toggling between, wait, do I have a responsibility to turn this over to Congress? Do I have a responsibility to the White House? 
And there is some speculation that um, because of certain questions that that McGuire just didn't answer, that he likely talked to the president about this whistleblower complaint. So, yeah, a couple of things on that. Democrats seemed to be following the pursuit or the potential of a cover up from within the DNI for not giving the complaint and the inspector general report to Congress. That essentially, perhaps Trump, to your point, Claire, may have said, don't don't give it over. The The trick was that what McGuire was saying was that he he was delaying things. He, his intention was never not to send it, but he wanted to see whether it fell under executive privilege. And uh, and then it got in it got into the media, and then now it's op- out in the open. So what what are we arguing about anyway? It, it, the House got what they wanted in the end. Well, that's the thing is like we had this big debate on the live blog about the kind of like political wisdom of Democrats' line of questioning, and the two sides were basically, um, why are they so focused on process? Why is this so legalistic? they should be hitting the substance of the complaint instead of exactly why and where um, the complaint didn't make its way to Congress, especially because the complaint didn't make its way to Congress. As as Chad said, it didn't make its way as law dictates, but they have it now, right? And then the other side was, I think I was the only person on the other side, maybe, but... um, (laughs) The other side. I don't know if I took a stand. <laughs> the other side was. Was this just a debate in my head? Um, no, I disagree no. with you. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. The other side was, or my side was. Um, most people won't watch this hearing, and and I don't think it's fair to use it as a proxy for Democrats' overall impeachment message or plan. Um, and so it makes sense when you have the DNI. That's a weird use of it. When you have the director of national intelligence in front of you to focus on his part of this whole story and then you can fold what you learn. And he also, yeah, and yeah. he also refused, even though asked in many different ways, to comment on the actual contents of the memo and whether or not he thought it was true. Now, at one point, a Democratic member asked him, in the abstract, if a president pressured a foreign country to interfere in the election, would that be a bad illegal thing? And McGuire said yes. So I mean, I don't think there's I don't think there's any great mystery about whether or not McGuire thinks that this is a serious thing. It's just he was perhaps understandably obstinate about saying I cannot comment on the veracity of this well, complaint or whether or not I think it's it's all very interesting. And this is this is going to be I'm going to get out over my skis a little bit here. It's it's this is more impressionistic, but. You do not get the sense of McGuire, especially because he's only been on the job for a month and a half, that he is like a Trump loyalist just going above and beyond to protect Trump at all costs. What you actually get the sense is like he's new to the job. He is worried about protecting Trump to some extent, at least to the extent that anybody would be worried about their boss. Right. Um, And he's just trying to, as Chad said, go slow, feel things out. Now, in this case, it kind of got him got him into some trouble. But yeah, this to, this to me gets at what Democrats have to do in this impeachment inquiry in order to convince anybody that it's anything but just a partisan charade is I I've been ranting about this all week in our in-house channels. But I am I am not as convinced as people who just believe optimistically in, in like that American people really you know care about good governance and no corruption, for example, that Democrats are are going to be able to connect the the what they say is misconduct of the Trump administration to something that is some that is bad for more than just for more than a reason than that they say it's bad like they can't just say this is bad therefore Trump deserves impeachment they have to convince Americans that there was a national security threat or that there was corruption or whatever else and to, and that's why I was harping today during the live blog on this idea of process versus substance which is that Democrats with McGuire, aside from eventually sort of tiptoeing into that conversation, Claire, weren't hammering the director of national intelligence on whether or not, in his professional opinion, this kind of thing would be a national security threat. Because that that's the, the, the key link to me. Like when Mueller testified, I can't remember who asked him, but Mueller was a very reluctant witness, but someone asked him, what is the greatest threat right now that we face? And he almost lit up from within and said, mm-hmm. 
it's election interference. And let me talk about election interference for five minutes. I don't think anyone, maybe McGuire by the end was just, I think he was a little bit wrung out by the experience by the end. I mean, it got pretty testy between Schiff and McGuire towards the end of the three and a half hours. But no one necessarily gave him an opportunity and an open-ended question to say, how do you feel about election interference and how how troublesome is it? Now, he did take a time to talk about how our greatest threat isn't kinetic warfare, which is a regular, which is a way of saying like killing people. Um, it is uh, cyber warfare. And he mentioned election inter- interference, right? He did, that. but it, it wasn't like a no one. No one really teed him up in the way that I, I remember Mueller being teed up to talk about this concern. And I do think, you know, t- to McGuire's particular situation, he is. I was talking about this with someone like career bureaucrats, people who value the advancement through the ranks. You know, obviously he's he was a longtime military person, but also you've you've spent your entire career maneuvering to this place, and you become acting director because of you know the happenstance of this this really tumultuous administration. I do think I mean it it does mirror in some ways the Comey situation too in my mind because it's almost this this stuck in the middleness and this no clear answerness because the executive branch. It, you know, in this current case, is because there's it is uncharted territory. Like I don't, I do think that there is some someone someone in the hearing said, well, there are lots of lawyers and lawyers disagree, yeah, <laughs> on what to do about this. So, McGuire um, as the kind of befuddled bureaucrat is an interesting figure. No, I think that's right. And I do think you saw daylight between him and the White House. He didn't sort of um, take the bait when Republican lawmakers would say. Right. We're so sorry that you're being blah 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 blah. So like he would he wasn't he wasn't like he bought he like saw what they were doing and he was kind of like I am a political I um, don't you know. He he tried to maintain that. I guess I just think to go to to zoom out again this this McGuire hearing despite what he said, you know, no one's heard of this guy. Um a poll came out today from Survey Monkey and Business Insider showing only a third of Americans have even heard about stuff about Ukraine so far. But he's the most popular man in America. <laughs> he's the most famous Sorry. man. Sorry. Um, so, like, I just don't think that I think we're going to look back and in the grand scheme of things, this hearing will be a footnote at best in, in the ordeal of this impeachment inquiry. And I think that... Um, I think that the complaint, the details of the complaint, which came out today, that's amazing to, re- to remember. Um, the, the, they are the thing here to so, me. So yeah. let's talk about what's, what's to come next for, for this uh, inquiry. It seems like because of the complaint, Democrats know pretty clearly who they are going to want to talk to in a congressional setting. Let's say you subpoena Rudy Giuliani. I cannot imagine that Rudy Giuliani is going to appear before Congress willingly or that the administration will let him do so. And so are we headed just straight for an executive privilege fight that will go to the Supreme Court kind of thing? I don't want to comment on the legal part of it, but we are going to have a big fight about who can testify, yeah. Um, And that's really about co-equal branches of government and whether Congress actually has subpoena power over the executive. That's the super interesting part of all this, is the fight between the branches right now. Well, but you would imagine they would testify not only Giuliani, like Giuliani in some ways... I guess he's of, not part of the executive branch. Yeah, and some yeah he's, he's, he's like the, the president's least personal inter- lawyer. Right. Um, but like Pompeo, people on P- Pompeo. Uh, st- Pence? Pence. The diplomats that are named in the complaint that, as following up with the Ukrainian officials. Ex- yeah, so so okay. So there, there are kind of two universes of people who you would follow up with, and they, they overlap, I'm sure. One is people involved in the care and feeding of the— evidence surrounding the call with Ukraine and any other communication between Trump and Ukraine, right? And the complaint goes into some detail about how the White House took steps to treat this call as like uber national security classified secret, even though even though on on substance it wasn't because they were aware, according to the person who made the complaint, that it was it was an abuse of power, essentially. So there's that universe, the universe of people who were involved in the like documented, the universe of people who were involved in 
handling the call and the call's artifacts, so to speak. There's also the universe of people that you just mentioned, Chad, that that were involved in the actual logistics to the extent they took place of allegedly Trump using the military aid to pressure Ukraine to investigate Biden. And the complaint, as I said before, lays out a far more um, robust effort in that regard than I think we initially thought or that I initially thought. So if it's that robust, it presumably involved a lot of people, which gives Democrats a ton of avenues to, to and it might be bigger than Ukraine. Whether or not the Democrats want to try and expand the inquiry, if the complaint, the the whistleblower's complaint, is accurate, that this kind of uh, different lane for certain conversations existed within the White House for things where they didn't want the transcript or summary or whatever these were to get out, then that suggests there were other calls, maybe with other leaders. And I'm sure Democrats will at least start to to, to pull at that thread. No, the, yeah, the complaint says that, right? That, it that, says there were. This is not the first time. And I my think. point is, those yeah. are more people to subpoena, or more people right. to try and to try and, uh, and uh, call for for a hearing. But he's. I mean, this is like Trump's in some trouble here. So yeah, <laughs> let, let's step back. Forty eight hours ago, you guys were sitting here with Nate after Pelosi gave her speech, and I think at one point during that, I forgot who said it. Someone said the equivalent of like this isn't actually that much of a change from what congressional Democrats had already been mm -hmm. pursuing because there were these inquiries into, into the Trump administration. Forty eight hours later, does that still hold for you guys? Well, there were already committees that were sort of formed to be investigating the Trump administration. I think that those it, from a purely logistical sense of like who will be running this investigation, like who like are there staff members? There are probably people much more sort of queued up to to pursue this. But I do think that the that the phone call, that the memo, that the potential testimony of the whistleblower are new there are new facts. And um, the the Democrats are trying to just say that what is already public is enough for impeachment, right? The idea of abuse yeah. of power that we all have read about in that phone call is enough. Now we will do. Now we will hold these hearings to sort of bolster that claim. But we don't like. They're trying to. They're trying to put out there like this is. This is new. This is impeachable. Now we will. I don't know what to say. Like kind of gird up those um, allegations. No. Yeah. And in, in a very. I think. I, I think it was Nate who said it. Who said like not much has changed. In a very like mechanical sense, that's true. I think. Um, as Claire said, the kind of committees who were doing investigating are still going to be doing investigating. But it's kind of like, okay, you might be in the same car. Let's go back to our car m metaphor from the from the previous show. You might it be worked in the same, so well in the previous show. Uh, you I might don't be in the same. <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, you might be in the same car, but there's a difference between driving at five miles an hour and a hundred miles an hour, right? That's really the change here. Is now with Pelosi on board. The impeachment inquiry, such as it is, um, has has gone into overdrive. So, and it has because real there's so much because now. there's so much media attention now that it inevitably it's a greenhouse effect, right? Like whatever was happening. I'm mixing that metaphor. It's a greenhouse effect. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the I car. Am, I am hijacking your car. <laughs> You're hotboxing the car. I'm putting it. Yeah, I'm hotboxing the car. I'm taking it to the greenhouse. No, it's just because there is so much more attention. The sun is shining hotter on the committees. Mm. Whatever. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is inevitably going to affect um, what what ha no, maybe not what happens in the investigations, but how the people who are leading the investigations relate the narrative of what they're doing. How how much closer like the the scrutiny and the reporting is, and all those things. How the White House. I Pe people report on it. it. I do think it changes the, the tone entirely. You're right, Micah. I, I get all that. But to extend the metaphor, the fuel in the car oh is God. way different now than it was before, which is to say leading into now, Democrats were tr were investing, investigating the Trump administration on more opaque, hard to understand uh, scandals. For me, though, what's changed isn't Democrats' interest in impeaching Trump. It's they actually now have the fuel, they think, to do it. 100%. 100 percent. But that I don't think anyone was saying otherwise. Are, no one's actually in the public heard what happens when you and I disagree but say the same thing. <laughs> no, like, no, it okay. happens for all the time just, in the For those just okay. listening, but I'm wait. just sitting here like 
Ping okay. ponging back and forth. We all agree the fuel is much more supercharged now. We all agree the car is going faster. We disagree about whether it's being hot box and or driven to a greenhouse. Is that the state <laughs> of things? Accurate, yeah, that's okay. an accurate summary. Good, Micah. You should, uh, you should <laughs> host the podcast. Oh, I really... Yeah. I begged off. Okay, <laughs> let's take one more step back, and then we can bring this on home. Do we know anything in the last 48 hours about how the public is responding to the impeachment inquiry? Yeah, so actually, this is what I was I was going to add to that, to the last section of the conversation. The Even if, it, like, mechanically the impeachment inquiry isn't that much different, the, the change in fuel, as Chad said, um, where it's now based on Ukraine— but more than that, the change in in the Democratic stance on it, Claire was getting at this. At the very least, um, you would expect. Oh, so two day before this Ukraine story really hit impeachment, not only like hasn't been popular among Republicans and independents, there was a big chunk of Democrats who weren't on board with impeachment. Right. So in the wake of Ukraine, now that Democrats are are sort of like the caucus is behind impeachment now i think what we'll see and what we are already seeing in the very few polls we've gotten since the story broke is democrats more more unity on the democratic side among elected officials and among voters behind impeachment right and so if that happens let's say democrats coalesce behind impeachment then what you would expect is it'll get closer to at least the 50 50 issue in the country right and then of course you get into what do independents think? What do Republicans think? And are Republican senators, for example, a good bellwether for Republican voters? Or is there a disconnect between that on an issue like this about the Trump presidency? Well, I don't think we necessarily care, care about like the Republican base. I think we care about people who might have traditionally voted Republicans but are troubled by these allegations. Or, or to quote Mitt Romney. Want. That's what Mitt Romney says, <laughs> sure. that he's troubled. No, and and— and yeah, so in that sense, I think there are Republican senators and members of the House who are a good proxy for Susan Collins, right? For that more, and even if you go to the like, Susan Collins is known as a moderate. Um, someone like our sta uh, perpetual stand-in Pat Toomey, Pat Toomey. Um, I think he's a good stand-in, not for like the Trump diehard, but for like the more a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more marginal Trump supporter, which is to say, like, it would t it, it won't take Trump shooting someone on Fifth Avenue to get that person to distance themselves from Trump. It might take something really, really big, but this could be really, really big. Let's leave it there. Thanks, Claire. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. It was a pleasure talking politics so with you. So fun. Usually I only talk about the Mets in this studio now. <laughs> Listen, wait, let's plug your Mets podcast. It's sort of Mormon, just like the Mets. <laughs> <laughs>